The phenomenon of sleep has always been of great psychological importance to the human being. We know that the faculties and perceptions of man gradually developed over a long period of time and were conditioned largely by those environmental circumstances with which he was anciently familiar. We know definitely that the total impact of the visible world upon man has conditioned him and resulted largely in the specialization of his way of life as we know it. He observed water, air, clouds. He felt the impact of light and darkness. And he was constantly in contact with the forces of life moving around him in the other kingdoms of nature. He became keenly conscious of the growing seed, of the tree, of the habits of animals and the birds. And by degrees, all of these different environmental factors moved in upon his own internal receptivity, leaving marks, tracing, in the subtle substances of his subconscious. During these periods, man was largely a receptive creature. He had very little available internal resource. He was unaware of himself as a factor capable of dominating nature. And the experiences around him did not immediately induce him uh, to an aggressive attitude. Everything which he contacted, everything which impressed itself upon him, seemed to have a life and way of his own, of its own. It did not need him. But gradually he became aware that he required its help for his own survival. It never occurred to him to chain the clouds or to stop the course of water. His inventiveness was not yet born. And he wandered about in a world that seemed complete without him. He also recognized the basic needs of his kind for food, shelter, and these rudimentary necessities. He became more and more conscious of dependence, and this dependency uh, did not uh, result in an aggressive attitude. It was only after more faculty development and the release of more resource from within his own nature that he began to survey the world in terms of conquest. In these early times, therefore, he had what we would term today a psychic sensitivity. He had a keenness of perception, as yet unconditioned by reflection. The growth of reflective faculties and powers led to interpretation of nature, but observation led only to the acceptance of natural things. And in the course of these acceptances, he became increasingly aware of the two principal states of himself, waking and sleeping. Sleep was for him, at one time, an almost detached phenomenon. He considered sleep as a thing of itself. It came upon him. It was not part of his own nature, but was induced by the ways of life around him. The principal factor, probably, in environment was night. For before the development of fire, man was helpless in the darkness. It might be true that he had keener sight perception than he has today, but he could not compete with the visual skill of animals and birds. Therefore, with the coming of darkness, he came to a period of inaction, a period in which he could only wait. 
And in this period of inaction, the darkness around him crept in upon him. And he found himself entering a kind of internal darkness. He found consciousness slipping away from him. And he joined all the rest of nature in a period of repose. He probably had no concept that sleep was necessary. It was rather inevitable. For man was surrounded by inevitable. And about these, he contemplated as best he could, which was not very effectively. Gradually, however, as his life became more involved and complex, and fire gave him a certain victory in darkness, it became more and more obvious that sleep was a mechanism which he could not control and for the lack of which he suffered unhappy consequences. Also, throughout all this procedure, man in a primitive way had experienced sleep phenomena. We know that animals experience it. Years ago, I used to keep dogs, and I have watched a dog asleep. His feet were moving as rapidly as possible. His entire nature, though unconscious, was alert, and there was no question in the world that he was romping somewhere. And a certain physical reaction was obvious in his body, as it is in the bodies of sleeping human beings. Thus animals certainly do have internal phenomena. But in man, with a larger group of faculties, this is more evident and pronounced. After all, what we would term integration must result from a certain victory over unknowns. A man of old time did not have this victory. He did not, therefore, have this integration this ability to bring reasonable and logical forces to play upon his activities. Thus in sleep, with its phenomena, he was not certain uh, that he was really merely resting. He became increasingly convinced that the gateway of sleep led into another world, a world with its own activities, a world that transcended the dimensions and boundaries of material existence. His sleep was variously animated with dreams and other similar occurrences. And in these dreams, time and place, relationships, and all the familiar situations of life were exaggerated, distorted, or changed. Perhaps one of his earliest experiences was this strange extra-dimensional quality of sleep, both regarding place and time. Thus in his sleep, he could mingle with his dead ancestors. In sleep, he could meet and appear to know beings which he found no equivalent for in his outer or objective waking state. Thus sleep affected him religiously and psychologically. It introduced him to the concept of ghosts. It gave him the belief that while his body rested, some part of himself departed therefrom and roamed in a region with different dimensions and relationships. Even modern man experiences visions which he regards as legitimate experiences. And many modern persons have firmly believed that during sleep they have a kind of separate existence. It is hard for them to deny this in the presence of the various things that occur during the sleeping processes. Today we regard sleep largely as an internal phenomenon, assuming that it is enriched with the psychological patterns which have already been impressed within our natures. We also find sleep symbolism susceptible of analysis and diagnosis, and gradually we have tied it closely uh, to the pressures uh, by which man is afflicted or with which he afflicts himself. Gradually, however, out of this broad generality, uh, there came several 
also rather broad schools of thought. And we may say that sleep as symbolism, entirely apart from dreams or visions or things of that nature, that sleep has contributed several major concepts uh, to the growth of man. In philosophy, for example, the question of sleep has brought with it several other questions relating to the fact of human consciousness. The Greeks, following somewhat the Platonic philosophy, and this in turn was rooted in older systems of Grecian learning, began to question the relationships of waking and sleeping. Because sleep life was much more vital, but much more mutable, changeable, and also in many ways represented, symbolically at least, processes not available in waking, such as teleportation, or the motion of the body from place to place, the ability to fly, to explore distant lands, to meet ancient and sated people, to experience rituals and rites, all of these things occurring in sleep, led the Greeks to ponder this simple question. What is man's natural consciousness? Is he actually awake, while he is awake, or does he really actually wake out of his so-called waking state through the mystery of sleep? In other words, is sleep a real awakening? Is man asleep in this world? Is his objective existence a kind of dream from which he is rescued by the mystery of sleep? Is he actually a citizen of this world or of his sleep world? By degrees, this philosophical problem became subjected to moral and cultural interpretations. One of these assumed, of course, that sleep represented a deficiency of consciousness, and another system that sleep represented a release or enlargement of consciousness. Most objectively, uh, to primitive man at least, Sleep represented a negative state. Therefore, to the philosopher, sleep could well be compared to ignorance. Ignorance was a sleeping of the mind, or its failure to awaken. And those creatures in whom the, fac in whom the faculties of cognition, of reflection, were dim or undeveloped, were said to be asleep, though awake. Now, we all realize that we use the term sleep symbolically on a number of instances, in a number of instances. We refer to the individual as sleeping through experiences or failing to awaken to the urgency of causes. Indifference, therefore, suggests a lack of internal activity whereas interest indicates an activity from within the person. In the old religious rites and systems, therefore, in ritualism and symbolism, man was said to possess another waking-sleeping polarity, which might function during his so-called conscious or awaking hours. Thus the wise, or those in whom the internal life was strong, were regarded as having a kind of wakefulness, whereas the unwise, or those unlearned and unskilled, were said to be sleeping. The term soul was introduced into this concept, and it was assumed that souls slept in bodies until, through disciplines or through the integration of themselves, their powers were released. The sleeping soul has become a familiar symbol in fairy stories, as in the case of Sleeping Beauty, or the ancient Nordic rite of Brunhilde, uh, sleeping in the ring of flames, cast around her by Wotan. Thus, the sleeping self was presumed to dwell in the body, 
the re revelation or intensification of internal powers brought man to a state of waking. If therefore through indolence or through any failure to live to the fullest of his capacities and to continually increase these capacities, where such impulses were lacking, the person was said to be philosophically or spiritually asleep. This was one view in which sleep was regarded as inactivity. Now there was a parallel uh, concept that developed with it also. Namely, that because most men and most mortals living in this world are asleep to realities, this world is actually the place of deepest sleep. Those who are born are therefore declare, declared to fall asleep in the process of birth, from which they awaken gradually during the procedures of growth and unfoldment. Wherever man is unable to remember, as in the dawn of his own physical existence, he is assumed to be emerging from a kind of sleep. Sleep also uh, represents uh, represented to ancient man uh, the suspension of action and as a rhythmic procedure was strengthened uh, by his concepts of a polarized universe. The sleep came to be a kind of alternation, an inbreathing of life. And uh, life passing into sleep retired into itself finding its own root and uniting with it. Life awakening came forth out of itself into objectivity. Thus, an ancient concept, namely that waking is objective existence, sleeping subjective existence. This subjective-objective polarization was strengthened by man's observation of nature. He found winter and summer, he observed how in temperate zones trees and plants seem to die, how the tree casts its leaves and appears to be merely the skeletal remain of itself. Its energies disappear or retire deep into the earth and into the roots, and there it remains in a, in a state of hibernation until the return of the sun god. By this concept, then, all life passed through these periods of objective and subjective polarization. The man going to sleep and awaking was moving upon a rhythm with universal significance. This rhythm, bound to the cycle of light and darkness, seemed to imply that it was normal and proper that man should have this twofold kind of existence, an existence obvious and of which he was conscious, and then in existence less obvious, of which he was not conscious. All these elements gradually resulted in philosophical implications going still further. And we find in the rise of Christian thinking uh, that St. Paul refers to sleep as a kind of death, and that those who sleep retire into a miniature after-death state. This was also the belief of the Egyptians, who assumed that sleep was a little dying, and death a great sleeping. Thus, this polarization became associated with life and death as basic factors in man's pattern of environmental circumstances. To be alive, then, was to be objective. To be asleep was to be subjective. Now, objectivity became increasingly of, of important to man because he gradually filled his outer life with activities. And in the course of the unfoldment of his arts and sciences and crafts and trades and beliefs and opinions, and in the simple enjoyments, of whatever merits he had earned, man found sleep constantly interposing itself 
so that as he became more active, it became an interruption to him. It meant that every day he must cease in the midst of some work and rest, and that the next day he must continue this labor. To a degree, then, sleep contributed to his concept of immortality, and probably was responsible for his earliest convictions about rebirth because he made a, an important observation based upon nature around him, namely that things could appear to die and not really die. He observed in the difference between sleep and death in human bodies. He found that the body of the sleeping man had little more activity or sensory ac action than the dead body. But there was still a circulation in it, a warmth, he could determine the difference between sleep and death. And he therefore came to the conclusion that perhaps death itself, like the apparent death of the tree, was only of an appearance rather than of a fact. When he examined the dead tree or the dead appearing tree in winter, he found little trace of light because he would not know how to examine deeply enough to learn the truth. To him, the tree in winter was a corpse, cold, inanimate, and without sign of life. Yet even this corpse was revived. He also realized that the earth became sterile at certain seasons, that plants did not grow, that life did not come forth. But out of this barrenness at the touch of spring, life came, and man recognized the resurrection of the dead. He became aware that with the light of the vernal equinox came forth light drawn by the great light of the sun. Therefore, this season he set aside. We call it Easter. But to him it was the symbol of the restoration of life, the rebirth of things from darkness and from death. And in this visible circumstance he rested his own hope of an immortal existence. So waking and sleeping became associated with theology and led him to some of the noblest speculations of man relating to his own destiny, his own origin, and his own immortality. Western man continuing, however, to build a tremendous objective civilization, creating a greater and greater world around him, did not correspondingly enlarged the world within him. He did not attempt the cultivation of this unknown darkness which he calls sleep. Factually, he has not done so even to this time. And we are still confronted with this sleeping phenomena as a kind of interruption, a, a suspension of action, now regarded as necessary but perhaps not as factually important as we have come to believe. Because after all, believing creates habits. Habits create phenomena. And the sleeping problem of man may be considerably more a habit than we know. But this habit has been so firmly set by millions of years that it will not easily be changed or altered. And any alteration will be accompanied by marked disturbances in the patterns of human life. This searching, therefore, for the value in sleep led Western man further to the conclusion that sleep was a process of recuperation. He found that gradually during the course of the day he became weary. His energies became exhausted. And as a result of exhaustion, a toxic condition arose within himself, which gradually obscured his objective consciousness and forced him into a recuperative condition. By this recuperative procedure, he was re-energized or revitalized, and he began to ponder why this was true and what larger implications he could derive from it. This led him to another a discovery, namely that in some way recuperation 
is associated with quietude. That a man may sleep, which is the most complete example of quietude which he knows, but he may also come into a semi-sleeping state, in which his faculties are still active, but he is at the same time assuming a receptive attitude towards the uh, recuperative forces of nature around him. We term this relaxation. Man discovered that relaxation, like sleep, rested him. And he also gradually learned to know that relaxation could, to a measure, substitute for sleep. Not completely, but to a degree that gave him greater possibility of longer function without unconsciousness. By degrees, then, relaxation uh, unfolded its mystery in his experience, and he recognized quietude as very important. To attain quietude, he had to rest certain faculties and parts of himself, but he could rest these by his own decision rather than by the inevitable processes of nature. He could resolve to rest. He could set up mechanisms for relaxation. He could also learn to diversify activity so that some parts of him rested while others labored. He discovered that rest was really a letting down of tensions and that intensity is a constant drain upon vitality. He further observed that as his objective life became more arduous and complicated, his activities more numerous, his ambitions stronger, his cravings more pronounced, uh, that sleep as he knew it was no longer completely sufficient to him. One of the reasons for this, undoubtedly, whether he recognized it or not, was the intrusion of his living state upon his sleep state. It is quite possible that primitive man, because he had very little objective integration, was not as disturbed in his sleep as the man of today. Now, the fact that we may or may not remember disturbance does not necessarily mean that it does not exist. And we have today an increasingly um, important body of evidence to indicate that the individual does not always rest while sleeping. He may awaken in the morning, to use a current phrase, as tired as when he went to bed. He discovers that rest does not cause him to awaken refreshed and ready for the day. Instead of bouncing from his couch of sleep, full of activity, he crawls forth and staggers into the kitchen for that cup of coffee which will actually give him the momentum for activity. Sometimes this may be due to shortening the hours of sleep by again the encroachment of activity upon his rest requirements. He may be up too late. He may be up too early. In any case, he does not experience the completeness of sleep. In all probabilities, however, the irregularity of his hours is not the primary factor. For most persons do the greater part of their sleep resting in the first four hours in which they are asleep. From the fourth to fifth hour onward, uh, sleep is less deep and the consciousness is drifting inevitably back toward the waking state, so that he accomplishes more in the early hours of sleep in terms of total rest than in the later hours. In any event, however, he awakens and finds that he is not rested. In some way, his objective existence has become so pressureful that sleep will not compensate for it. As a result, he must begin to reorganize his waking state, aiming at a conservation of resources, and particularly striving to prevent the rapid increase of toxin 
which sleep must overcome or neutralize. To do this, he has developed arts and sciences suitable to give a measure of rest and repose during waking hours. Where these are proper and normal, they certainly contribute to his well-being. But if he must have recourse to artificial sedation in order to achieve sleep, it means that the encroachment of waking activity is too great. Now this encroachment may result in two consequences. One, difficulty in sleeping, and the second, disturbance during sleep. The individual whose mind is too active, which means too objectively focused upon occurrences, may have difficulty in achieving the condition necessary to sleep. Nature, of course, is rather wise in its workings and almost inevitable in its procedures. Therefore, when exhaustion becomes acute, man has to sleep. And there are very few persons who have actually died from lack of sleep, unless they were under some artificial pattern of extreme stimulation. Nature will demand that rest which it absolutely requires. But where the patterns are not well integrated, uh, the individual does not have the same sense of well-being, which comes from rationalization of procedure. Actually, man has to achieve polarization of activity constantly in order to remain well. Therefore, his waking hours, which occupy some two-thirds of his time, must also be divisible into periods of activity and repose. The human being, because of mental activity, does not find it easy to repose by doing nothing. The process of merely sitting down and trying to rest is boring and nerve-wracking to the average individual. Therefore, he seeks repose uh, by reducing tension and selecting activities uh, which do not appear arduous to him. Thus he finds entertainment, relaxation, sports, all kinds of things uh, which are themselves still activities contributing uh, to rest, largely because they temporarily disassociate his mind from intensive programs of survival. The rising tide of uh, economics and the pressures resulting therefrom have, uh, has caused a great deal of tension in man. And the generation in which we live, with its very highly competitive approach to living, causes more fatigue than the individual can commonly compensate for by sleep as he knows it. Thus a whole group of remedial agencies have been introduced to give man rest while he is awake. Not only rest, perhaps, but to copy, in so far as is possible, the very recuperative processes of sleep, thus through specialized consideration of nutrition, through the use of vitamins, uh, through the development of certain attitude toward, attitudes toward life, man attempts to compensate for overactivity in certain brackets or branches of his daily living. Philosophy, of course, and religion have taken the attitude that attitude itself can be either a cause of rest or a cause of pressure. Faith, for example, is a magnificent relaxing power. Fear, on the other hand, is a source of tension and causes an unreasonable exhaustion of resources. Man has also learned uh, that there are two distinct ways of becoming tired. One is by physical activity, and the other is by mental activity. Mental activity, becoming increasingly important as the human faculty structure increases in power and intensity, mental activity, if constructive, produces less tension than if it is destructive. 
An individual can think happy thoughts for a long time without noticeable or appreciable fatigue. But a few moments of unhappy thoughts will bring as a result a distinct sense of depletion. And out of these things a kind of morality has developed. An ethics based upon experience. Man has learned that bad mental, emotional, and physical habits produce exhaustion. Exhaustion in itself interferes with function. The exhausted person is unable to carry the responsibilities of life with dignity. The only answer seems to be that the person must overcome the false causes of exhaustion in himself. If, therefore, he is resolved to achieve a sense of well-being which might result from a normal relationship between sleeping and waking. He must now make certain conscious cooperations with natural procedure. He must attempt uh, to cultivate repose and to escape from all such pressures as are contrary to repose. Ambitions, for example, uh, may be most gratifying, and the individual may become hopelessly addicted to them, but they are exhausting. And wherever ambition or any other activity becomes overly dominant, where it becomes obsessive or possessive, it results in continuous patterns of energy expenditure, and these patterns end in not only depletion, but open the system to disease. Thus, out of his need for rest, man has discovered some of his most valuable secrets about health. For health is associated with normal rhythms of action and rest, not only allowing for waking and sleeping, but for innumerable small cycles developing in minutes and in hours, whereby for each expenditure of energy we must have a corresponding increase of energy reserve. If we fail to do so, we are in trouble. Further as we go along, man has observed that certain functions of his mind, certain habits and patterns of his emotions, have a tendency to cooperate with recuperative procedure. He finds that idealism uh, helps him to moderate extremes of action. Philosophy gives him a certain release from ambition, from possession, from fear, grief, and anxiety. He observes, therefore, that philosophy is, as the Greeks described it, a medicine for the soul. From these simple beginnings, then, of waking and sleeping, man has gradually unfolded a series of projections of thinking, which have influenced and to a large degree regulated his conduct. Not because he wished to be obedient, but because he could not afford the consequences of disobedience. Because by degrees he realized that he must obey in order to function in order to have an adequate and purposeful existence. In uh, religious systems, mysticism is a kind of waking sleeping. To the mystic, life becomes an exceedingly quiet, orderly communion with his own internal powers. He is therefore capable of completely relaxing, and uh, many of his faculties become uh, sonolent in this procedure. His ambitions retire or relax. His attachments to worldliness with the attendant pressures and responsibilities of achievement. Uh, these bonds are loosened. And he obtains a strange transcendent quietude. The ancient found this in his trance, and he believed that he could create within himself 
a kind of suspension of activity by means of which his entire objective life was held in abeyance, was not permitted to take over with its tremendous rhythms and powerful pressure incentives. In the experimenting with this factor, he made another discovery, namely that through quietude, objective quietude, a kind of artificial sleep induced by reason, that he became suddenly more aware of his internal life. He found that his, that his focal point moved from environment to self. He also realized that the direction of his energies flowed uh, now toward an internal life rather than toward an external career. Thus we begin to see uh, a differentiation between extroversion and introversion. The waking state being the natural polarization of extroversion. The sleeping state, the overall symbolic pattern of introversion. The individual retiring into himself appeared inanimate to others, but became increasingly animate to himself, as in the case of yoga or the Eastern disciplines, in which the reduction of objective activity results in the release of a tremendous internal activity, which, however, does not appear to have any direct fatiguing effect upon the body. Thus, by the suspension of the bodily functions, man became increasingly aware of an internal existence. He then began to draw away what he considered a curtain between waking and sleeping. And he discovered that the internal, introversional world of himself could be more real and more powerful than his external environment. Here he was placed, of course, in a, in a dilemma, because he learned also from experience the danger of a total introversion. He began to recognize the possibility of escaping from reality as he objectively knew it, into something imponderable, the, va the validity of which uh, he had not demonstrated. He wondered, therefore, whether his escape through subjectivity was an illusion, whether he was passing from fact to fancy, whether his inner life was merely a kind of half-waking dreaming, or whether perhaps he was approaching the reality of himself. Man had a certain ego from the beginning, and by this ego he liked to think that he was different, that he had a peculiar nature of his own, and that in some mysterious way he was greater than he seemed to be. This greatness uh, was not obvious, perhaps, in his relationship with others, but he could cultivate it in an imaginary life within himself. We know in psychology that a very primitive atavistic instinct throws man into himself in emergency, creating introversion. This introversion becomes associated with less and less, less centralization in matter. The individual is aloof, separate and apart. He may also gradually develop monastic inclinations, uh, turn to the life of the hermit, and even though he remains in society, build all his values upon intangibles. This, of course, made it important to estimate uh, the, the strength of these intangibles, whether this internal life could be depended upon. In those days, he was no psychologist. And he was not aware of how the inner life is molded by environment and other factors of external existence. He could not realize, and did not, that a great part of his subjective existence was merely objectivity moving in upon him. Thus his visions, his meditations, his reflections could well be only the symbolic representations of his activities. But not certain of this, not 
having any yardstick with which to measure, he fell into the habit of assuming that these internal patterns were not merely projections of environment, but represented some kind of a life within him. At least he had an interpretive internal by which he could give new meaning and color to even the most common of everyday experiences. Thus inwardly he developed imagination, and imagination in turn became one of the most powerful creative forces that he had. And yet this same imagination could be a danger, for if he could imagine progress he could also imagine trouble. He could find himself creating false values and imposing them upon his environment. This is particularly true of intense introversion because it nearly always results in a false estimation of externals. It causes the individual not only to escape from realities but to seek to escape from his own interpretation of realities, thus burying, burying himself deeper and deeper into the subjective part of his own life. The only possible censorship by which man could determine whether his internal life was valid or not was through experimentation. And the only experiment that was really useful was to determine, if possible, what would happen internally if external pressures were removed. This led, of course, to the life of renunciation. It led to the individual's conscious and voluntary detachment from externals, his rejection of them, in an effort to determine how his own life would be if it was not constantly conditioned by objective activity. Thus came the gradual religious belief that if man is to have an inner life, he must in some way relax his outer life, that he cannot serve two masters, and that if he is to follow the prince of this world, he cannot know the mystery of the other world. Obviously, the changing patterns of his objective life did affect his subjective reactions and reflexes. He found that if he refined his personal living, if he rejected or renounced extremes, if he sought to live moderately, if he did not permit himself to be possessed by his own possessions or obsessed by the attitudes of those around him, that gradually his internal life became more tranquil. To the degree, therefore, that he did not waste energy, he had more energy available for other things. All these circumstances undoubtedly affected his dream life in sleep. And where he was not under false external pressures, he did not have the unpleasant dreams that still are unfortunate emblems of neurosis. He also discovered through time, however, that the dreams did not follow his inclinations, but followed his attainments only. Therefore, if he renounced intellectually certain beliefs or attitudes, but still cherished them in himself, the dreams remained true to the facts and not to the uh, policies which he was attempting to adapt. It therefore became a kind of censorship. Things had to be true, they had to be real, they had to be right. Renunciation of material objectives had to be honest, or else the internal life did not change or was not refined. He observed that sanctified persons, those who had truly achieved a spiritual life, uh, had experiences in dreams and sleep appropriate to their attainments. Their sleep became beautiful. Their inner life became rich. 
and whether it was because, again, it was reflecting the attainments of their outer personalities, was not of the first concern. It was this change was real. And moreover, this change was of great comfort and great utility and became the basis of an inspiration for common service by which the teacher, the leader, the priest came into natural and reasonable existence. So through all these procedures, Western man gradually integrated a large psychological concept. He became aware that man must have action and rest. He came to realize also that internals and externals must be balanced. And that the individual whose internal life was neglected would ultimately fail in his external concerns. He also realized the increasing danger of this crisis due to the rapid development of externals and also due to the natural channel of the sensory perceptions which were responsive particularly to externals and therefore were bombarding his inner life constantly with reflexes and uh, sensory reactions. Out of this came the philosophic life, or the life of reason, the life of rationality, the individual organizing his affairs, seeking to bring a pattern suitable to his needs upon all of his activities. Muhammad, prophet of Islam, is said to have established a code by which he divided the day into three equal parts, each consisting of eight hours. One of these parts he devoted to the needs of his people, the second to the private needs of his own life, and the third to rest. By following this regime carefully, he found that in all departments he was more able, had greater resources, and he discovered what many have discovered, namely that internal integration uh, reduces the time factor in accomplishment. The person moving from a strong inner point can achieve more in an hour than the unorganized individual can achieve in a day. Therefore, time taken for integration is not time lost. The integrated result becomes a great time-energy conservation. And work is man's expenditure of energy within time. And therefore it is important that he recognize that he is a creature with limited energy availables, that he must use these to the best of his ability, and at the same time protect adequately his own recuperative power. By the organization of living, he therefore balanced his relationship with nature. He paid his proper taxes to the universe and learned not to overtax himself. This all led uh, to our recognition of another point, namely that civilizations, cultures, systems uh, can become so complicated and so heavy that they gradually press in upon the individual and destroy him. Man must then learn to discriminate between the importance of the things he does and the value of the thing he is. This discrimination is yet, not yet generally attained, but it is a discrimination that must come, for without it man cannot survive. Now all this development in Western thinking was polarized by another development, which is essentially the Eastern approach uh, to the mystery of sleep and to the symbolism which it implies. In the Orient, the question has naturally arisen as to why the human being is in a state of constant turmoil. In other words, the East questions empirically and totally what we call our way of life. Instead of achieving a compromise with nature, as has been the tendency of Western man, instead of attempting a personal adjustment with action and repose, the Eastern individual 
comes straight to what he considers to be the basic problem. Namely, what is the purpose of man? Oh, in the West, we will have a hundred answers, most of them essentially identical. The same is true in the East. We will have many systems, many sects, many groups, many beliefs. But to a large measure they will unite in one purpose, in one concept. Namely, the essential purpose for man, or of man, is the unfoldment of his internal life by intent. The purpose of man is not to build a greater world, primarily but to build a greater internal integration. In the East, therefore, we have this concept that man should first find himself in order that he may know his needs, that he may understand them, and that he may plan for them, and that the beginning of progress is the overcoming of ignorance, and that the ignorant individual can leave a monument but it will be in the wrong place. And it will also be the wrong monument. And others must sometime move it away. Uh, we remember, of course, years ago, there was an epidemic of creating statues in local communities. These statues frequently representing either a Civil War soldier or a Spanish-American War veteran. These stood in every town, often flanked with a cannon and a heap of cannonballs. In the course of time, it has been necessary to move practically every one of these statues because they always stood where some improvement was absolutely necessary. In the course of time, therefore, things which sentimentally were well intended had to be shifted, changed, and readapted to meet the rise, for example, of an automotive generation among peoples. And the living must ultimately take precedence over the traditions of the dead. That which is necessary must be done. In this thinking, the East then uh, had a tendency, a very strong tendency, to reverse the entire sleep-waking concept. Instead of assuming, therefore, that by sleep uh, was meant a kind of inaction, they took the attitude that sleep was in one way or another the strange symbol of total action. That sleep, perhaps, was the one state of man uh, which was true. Because in his waking, he has become totally submerged in his own psychological mechanisms. The moment he wakes up, he makes a mistake. <laughs> This, in turn, requires five more to make it endurable. These, in turn, require more mistakes to sustain them. And before he is finished, these mistakes cause him so much economic expense that he is hardly able to support himself. In order to meet this emergency, he must work harder, which means that he must eat more, which means that he must sleep longer, and he enters into a vicious circle in which he works in order to pay for sleep and sleeps in order to have energy to work. This confusion does not appear solutional to Eastern man. Perhaps one of the reasons is that his total nature is different, that he never moved or has not as yet moved uh, from the tremendous religious foundation of the past onto the highly industrialized foundation of today. Even if he makes this move, he will probably be a rather different person from Western man, because as the child, differently conditioned, uh, shows this conditioning in maturity, we know that whereas the West began to move strongly onto a materialistic footing at a very early time. The East has remained through its childhood, infancy, and adolescence largely upon a theological footing. And even if it should change over now, the vast experience behind it 
will not easily be totally obliterated. Eastern man then comes to this conclusion. What are the things about living that we do not like? Well, we do not like worry, fear, grief. We are constantly bombarded with stimuli which cause us to release negative foreboding. We are surrounded constantly by evidence which if once we become melancholy ourselves bears witness to tragedy. We see around us either life or death according to our own natures. One man will say there is a person born every second. Another will say there is a man die every second. It depends upon our attitude and the bombardment of the pressures which we now are forced to endure have gradually corroded and corrupted our optimism until we look out upon a world ever more frightening in its aspect, ever more likely to cause disturbance to our own inner life. Disturbed in ourselves, we disturb each other, and the personal securities of home, family, and friendship are undermined until by degrees we return to a kind of concrete jungle filled with advantages and inventions and ingenuities, but incapable of preventing man's inhumanity to man. Now, Buddha, in one of his discourses, asked the disciple whether or not he would consider it wonderful if man could come to a condition in which he neither worried nor feared, in which he was not obsessed, in which he was not variously made miserable uh, by ambitions or by various circumstances around him, if he could therefore attain uh, this state in which fear no longer existed, in which pain, moral pain, emotional pain, were no longer real, in which there was no uncertainty about providence, in which the individual was not burdened by suffering in any of its attributes. Would not such a situation be miraculous? The disciple assented, and Buddha pointed out that this occurs to man every time he goes to sleep. For when he is asleep, he is not afraid. When he is asleep, he is not suffering uh, from emotional or mental pain. When he is asleep, he is not overambitious. When he is asleep, he is not aware of tragedy or darkness. He is aware, apparently, of nothing. So Buddha pointed out this point, or this fact, that sleep, in some way, wraps up all this tangle of light and gives it a blessed rest. And that in this unconsciousness alone, man is released from consciousness. Now this would seem to be a rather doubtful way of attaining release. Western man would rather climb the mountain, fight his way inch by inch by sheer aggression, in the hope that ultimately he can fashion a golden age out of his own skill and attainment. The East, however, points out very obviously and very sensibly that if without sleep man would die under the present tensions and stress of living. And therefore his life is rooted, his survival is rooted in unconsciousness, not in consciousness. It is not his consciousness, but his unconsciousness that preserves him makes it possible for him to continue and gives him that blessed recipe from all these things which he calls important. Yet Buddha also was enough of a psychologist to realize there was a difference between sleep and death. And the analysis of this difference was not in a degree of man's awareness, but in the facts themselves. 
The sleeping man is not dead. He is alive. Therefore, unconsciousness is not dead, as we have come to believe it to be. Unconsciousness is not not being. For the tired, tense, struggling man, finding sleep, relaxes, the lines depart from his face. He attains a strangely wonderful and peaceful appearance. He becomes the very personification of contentment while he is asleep. The moment he awakens, his brow wrinkles. He begins to remember the things he should have done or should be doing. Haste takes over, and he is picked up into this strange confusion of living. So in sleep, man suddenly becomes not a child exactly, but he becomes a totally integrated being. If he can do no good, he can do no harm. If he is not doing something, he at least is in the blessed state of not doing anything that is detrimental to him. And that is more than most persons can accomplish in a waking state. <laughs> he may not be wise, but he is not intemperate. He may not be contributing to his income, but he is certainly not squandering his means. <laughs> so it is a kind of strange situation that has a great many interesting and intriguing thoughts associated with it. A man going to sleep becomes unconscious of himself. He no longer knows where he is, what he is, or who he is. This in itself is a blessed revelation. <laughs> he therefore has no false estimations about himself. He is no longer a little man trying to be great, or a great man trying to find happiness. And yet, this man who goes to sleep enters this state with a solemn trust. He expects inevitably to awaken. And should he not awaken, he is not even prepared mentally or emotionally to contemplate the idea. He simply believes that he goes from his objective state into a security of rest, that this is right and proper, necessary and good. And yet in the appointed hour, he will awaken. He will awaken without knowing that he is going to awaken. He will awaken without any conscious effort to rouse himself. He will simply emerge from this state of subjectivity. And gradually, his center of awareness will move into the machinery of his sensory perceptions, and he will again be an objective creature. Thus this thing which we call unconsciousness, has in some mysterious way the power within itself to restore consciousness, to release it again. And from that which knows not itself, that which knows itself is restored to its own existence. Furthermore, when man goes to sleep, the past is not wiped out. He is not aware of it. It does not exist while he is asleep. But when he awakens, memory is restored and he remembers the unbroken continuity of the previous day. But he does not remember the period of sleep. Many very wise and uh, worthwhile observations can be based upon this. Buddha therefore recommended the concept that in sleep, man moves from a fragmentary state into a total state. That therefore he is never more completely alive than when he is asleep. Not because he is aware, but because there is no division of his faculties or his members or his parts. He is not dead. He is not in oblivion. He is simply in a strange state which he cannot examine with his objective faculties. 
the mind and the senses cannot analyze sleep because it belongs to a condition which they cannot experience due to the fact that they are totally objective. Man can contemplate the mystery of sleep. He can observe it in others. He can interpret it. But man cannot rationally experience it because the moment it sets in, he cannot experience. And the only experiences he can have relating to it are the driftings in and out or the disturbances caused by a dream phenomena during sleep. But total and complete sleep itself is a descending of oblivion. And yet in this oblivion, nothing ends. In this oblivion, there is no factor which divides, which abruptly terminates anything. Therefore, all consciousness, as we know it, moves unconsciously through sleep without any change or diminution in itself. It moves very much as the radio wave, which can be understood in its source and can be interpreted in the receiving set, but which moves invisibly and intangibly through the connecting atmosphere where it cannot be observed and cannot be analyzed. In the sleeping state, man then is rescued by a total experience, and that is why sleep rests him. It is why sleep is the solution to all exhaustion and fatigue, because in some way, beyond our cognition, it is the restatement of the reality in ourselves. In this phenomenon, therefore, some part of consciousness with which we are not aware, with which we are not capable of objective function, which does not contain within it the complex of selfhood, which is the source of man's objective life. This consciousness, beyond self-consciousness, becomes the healer, becomes the wonderful source of the remedying of all of the defects caused by selfness. If this be true, we have the psychological basis of Buddhistic philosophy, which seeks to attain this situation or condition of not-selfness, which is not the denial of self, but the suspension of the self in something superior to itself, namely consciousness itself. Now, we think of consciousness always in terms of self-consciousness. Buddha insisted that this is not correct. Self-consciousness is almost the antonym of consciousness. It is its dualistic polarity, differing from it in almost all respects, inasmuch as self-consciousness is the consciousness of things, the consciousness of one as apart from, whereas true consciousness is the experience of all, or of totality. And because of totality, it cannot have a differentiated polarization. So man retiring into sleep retires into universal consciousness. He calls it sleep because it is the suspension of those faculties which he has developed and upon which he depends for what he calls his waking state. We have no reason to know, however, that what we call sleep is not in itself a superior state of consciousness to that of waking. Now this opens a large problem. 
A man cannot empirically answer it because he has not faculties capable of analyzing sleep. Which means that he has not the ability to experience a consciousness apart from self-awareness. Self-awareness ceases in sleep. Yet life goes on. The records of life go on. And from an unawareness, self-awareness is regenerated by awaking. So that it has been there all the time. Yet man has transcended it, suspended it. And because of this, if his rest is proper and correct, he awakens refreshed. Thus, in a way, self-awareness is the source of fatigue. And the suspension of self-awareness is the perfect rest. Now, rest does not mean inaction. Rest is not merely a negative thing. Because if rest was nothing, it could refresh nothing. Nor could it contribute to the function of anything. In rest, man attains to the availability of total energy. Therefore, rest is positive, and objectivity, which is the exhaustion of energy, is negative. A man lives because of an energy moving from rest to action. And without the transcendent, undivided, total energy behind him, he could not sustain any particular activity. Buddha went then so far as to explain, in his comprehension, that what we call universal unconscious consciousness is really a total consciousness, which man is totally incapable of registering. Therefore, the departure into sleep, resulting in the suspension of faculties, causes man to lose self-awareness. But in so doing, He is restored to universal fact or universal awareness. He cannot know the universal, but in sleep the universal knows him. And by uniting itself with him, restores his ability to continue his objective life. From these and many other considerations, you can see how interesting a field of speculation can be opened by sleep how it can contribute and has to the foundation of religions and philosophies, and how some comprehension of it, or at least certain of its consequences, could assist the individual by giving him incentives toward the regulation of his own conduct, so that he is capable of greater repose, greater rest, and greater faith in a universal life moving through him into action. From these things, modern man can take some comfort in the sincere belief that to the degree that he understands and cooperates with the great cycles of action and inaction in nature, he gains a security through the moderation of his own excesses and becomes capable, therefore, of a pleasant waking state and a dreamless sleep or one in which there are no phantoms to distract him. That only the the dream only represents the encroachment of his objective state upon his experience of total consciousness. If he is immersed too deeply in materialism, he cannot even escape it in sleep. But he should escape it, and he must escape it, through the reorganization of his career and his conduct. Because without this daily re-identification with life itself, he cannot endure. Nor can he have the resources to advance any proper program of growth and unfoldment. Time's up. two or three announcements which I'd like to make. I'm speaking on Wednesday evening 
the Women's University Club, 6th and Catalina, at 8 o'clock, in connection with the conference of the Association for Research and Enlightenment, the work doing, the work carrying on the activities of Edgar Casey. Anyone, I believe, who is interested is invited to attend. I would like to mention the fact that I placed a note on our bulletin board this morning relating to the distribution of literature on our premises uh, by persons not authorized to do so. I understand literature, which uh, uh, was highly, uh, shall we say, colored, was offered uh, to our people within the body of this theater uh, last Sunday morning. This is without our consent and is an infraction of the proper rules of um, domicile inasmuch as during a rental of this theater it is our property. And therefore, uh, any such action is unauthorized and improper. We cannot, however, prevent legally the distribution of literature on public sidewalks or outside the boundaries of our own uh, rental area. We do, however, wish to point out that any literature other than that which relates to our own activities is not authorized nor endorsed by us. And we hope that uh, we will not have a recurrence of this situation. I would also like to call attention to the fact that on the 26th of this month, I fly to New York for a series of lectures, uh, which will continue for about three and a half weeks. During that time, I will also make uh, short trips of one lecture each to Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I would suggest that if you have friends in those areas, that you ask them to watch their local papers. Uh, our general announcements uh, for books this morning will cover, perhaps, uh, various writings that we have dealing with consciousness. Our principal text on that subject is our book, Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, which we have not announced here for some time. We suggest that you consider it. And also, for current lecture activities and notes, and the republication of our various articles, we recommend that you subscribe to our magazine, Horizon. Also, we have several lecture booklets on the table now of lectures given here recently, some of which you may have missed and which you would like to have. Uh, those interested in a further analysis of the discussion of the morning are invited to attend the headquarters study group, which meets at our headquarters at Griffith Park and Los Feliz Boulevards at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Those attending will be guests of the headquarters study group and you are invited to come and bring your friends. The uh, subject will be a further consideration of the work of this morning. I'd like to also mention at this time that our last subject on this program and our last lecture here until April will be next Sunday morning the soul image as the immortal friend. This is an interesting psychological problem and the uh, basis of a great deal of drama, literature, poetry, philosophy, religious ritual, and symbolism. The story of the soul as the immortal and eternal friend of man. This Promethean friend is well worthy of careful thought. So we hope you will all be with us for the closing lecture next Sunday morning, and that you will bring your friends and if you wish announcements of our future activities and the continuation of our lectures and seminars and are not on our mailing list, will you please leave your names and addresses. Our mailing lists are not sold or exchanged. Therefore, you will not receive any publicity or announcements other than our own. Thank you very kindly for being with us this morning. <laughs>